What's happening? Welcome to On The One. My name's Corey Wong. Today we're gonna look at my tune, Corey and the Wong Notes theme. Now this is the theme song to my variety show, Corey and the Wong Notes, and it's also the title of the album. So this was just a project that I've had in mind for quite a while, and specific instrumentation, all recorded live on set of like a TV set that we built. It was really fun to do. The fun thing about coming up with a show is that I get to write a theme song. And inherently, a lot of my music already kind of sounds like TV music. It's actually one of the, the things that people say, like, oh, it sounds like, like, your stuff sounds like it would fit so well for a TV show or something. With this, I just tried to write something specifically for that because it is the theme song for the show. So. I wanted something that really showcases who I am as a guitar player and what the band is all about and have the energy of the tune really showcase what the show is all about in general. High energy, fun tune, and the album version, it's a little bit different than the show version only because I wanted to make it at least 30 seconds long so it would count as a stream on Spotify so I could make some money. A novel idea for a professional musician in the 21st century. So let's dive into the session. We recorded this whole thing live on the set, so there's some bleed between the mics. I'm totally fine with that. I'm actually used to that, and I like recording in the same room together because it actually adds to some of the sound, I think. It's not always the most ideal for isolation, but what it does is it kind of creates a forced tension for all of us to have to be on every take. You don't want to be the one who's going to mess up the take if everybody else crushed it. So we have drums played by Pitar Janic. We have all the percussion stuff played by Nega Santos. Bass guitar is Sonny Thompson. Guitar is me. Keys are Kevin Gastongwe. The brass section, trumpet one is Steve Strand. Trumpet two is John Lampley. Trombone is Michael Nelson. And then in the reeds, the woodwinds, we have Eddie Barbash on alto sax, Kenny Holman on tenor sax, and Sam Greenfield on Barry sax. And then there's some kind of extra sound effects and my lav mic. So I had a microphone, a lav mic just set up so I could talk to the band. It was in their ears and I'll show you that later, but I have it muted in the session. And I use the lav mic because it's nice to be able to communicate with the band while we're recording. Honestly, I don't really care if some of my yelling or to the bridge, gets in the horn mics or the drum mics. I don't really care. And it's normally not enough for it to really matter. And if anything, it kind of adds to the vibe of the tune. So uh, the mix is gonna feel a little bit different than the original because I sent this session to John Fields who ended up mixing the album and then it went and got mastered after that. So this is my mix that I sent to John. Honestly, it's like, it sounds pretty close, but John just makes stuff sound a little bit cleaner and better and tighter, so. And I also wanted another set of ears on it. I felt like with this, I was standing a little too close to the painting to really see what it was. And for this mix, I wanted another opinion and John is a better mixer than me. So here's kind of the general feel of the tune. Right, so there's that first half, and then there's this little thing where I enter the show. Now, normally in the show, when we do the theme, I enter from backstage, so I don't play this beginning part, but I do on this version. So then we have this little uh, Corey's entrance sequence. And then we're in on the second half of the song. Kind of stair steps up. Okay, so let's kind of dive into the parts. It's gotta be an E, because I'm a guitar player, right? I figured I wanna have this sort of thing because it's really tight. I wanna have the guitar and bass parts and the keyboard parts really work together and be arranged in one way and then have the horns work in their own way together, but a way that complements each other where we play a line and then the horns respond and then it's kind of back and forth weaving in and out for the arrangement. So arrangement wise, we were very intentional on this and 
Normally I like to have in the stuff that I produce something where there's a little bit of a floater role. And in this case, it's Nega on percussion. So she's playing congas, bongos, and little bells and extra stuff just to kind of give it a little extra lively feel, which is really cool. So let's just dive into the different parts. Let's go top to bottom in my session. So we start with the drums. And because this tune is only 30 seconds, let's just listen straight down to, to what each person played. So you can hear the bleed of the horns in there. I did not have a guitar amp on stage. Same with the keyboards and the bass was just a tiny bit. That's the drums. Now I added a little bit of a kick trigger and a little bit of a snare trigger because it added a little bit of extra oomph to both the kick and the snare. A lot of people hate using triggers. I have no ego about it. It just helps my mixes to sound better. As long as it's blended in and sounds natural, I'm down. Whether John Fields used these in the final mix or not, it sounds like he did, but maybe he used them a little bit less than what I did. Okay, now let's listen to Nega's parts because she's got some really interesting stuff happening. She's congas, bongos, and then every once in a while she hits this extra stuff. Again, she's kind of finding patterns and then the floater roll where it's moving around. It's really fun. Her parts are cool. She's standing right behind the drum. So there's actually a lot of drum bleed and some horn bleed in there because those instruments are loud. So the main thing you hear is her percussion instruments, but also there's some bleed, which then also makes it so I don't use any room mics. Like all the mics together are the room mics for the other instruments, if that makes sense. <laughs> and you can also hear her going, ah, 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 ah. You know, some of us do that when we play. You'll hear me doing that in the lab thing, but here it is again. <laughs> See her, she adds vibe by the vocalization. Now, what you'll notice, even though she's kind of that floater role, it's not really arranged, Patara's parts aren't really arranged, she's still kind of sticking to patterns and playing things that accent what we're doing musically, which is exactly what I look for in a percussion player. She is very intentional about what she plays. She had so much energy, so much vibe, but there's also so much purpose to everything that she's playing. You'll notice she went to the cowbells on the second half. She stayed on congas, bongos for the first half, then went to added some bells for the second half to just give it a little bit of a different lift, but also, pretty much stuck to patterns, two measure patterns with a little extra something else. And those kind of patterns help give the whole thing grounding, but also every once in a while interjecting something new that brings it to life, like I'm saying. Now, Sonny T, he's got the part, but he adds this extra stuff that literally only Sonny T can do. An absolute legend. His tone is insane. <laughs> It's got so much low end and so much top end to it. I've actually never heard a bass guitar have this sort of tone. It's crazy. And honestly, a lot of that is just in the way that he plays. But here's his part. Let's listen to him with the drums and percussion because it's really fun. Well, check this out, check this out. <laughs> check this. This is classic Sonny T-Line. I don't know how he thinks of it, 
Dude's genius. Dude's a genius. <laughs> His strings are so light. He uses ultra light strings, and I think that helped. That is part of the tone. And he plays upside down and backwards. So it creates a really unique thing in the way that he plays. Now, let's listen to the guitar just so you can hear the guitar tone. Of course, I use the archetype Corey Wong plugin. Come on, what else am I gonna do? So I ran this live. I was listening to this in my ears. I was monitoring this uh, from my computer. Just the default patch, straight up default. First, first tone that comes up, uh, my guitar. All knobs turned all the way up in fourth position strat. I had a little bit of EQ to cut the bottom and a little bit of the Wolf compressor just to add a little extra compression because I love the compressor. <laughs> Not the tightest playing I've ever had, but doesn't really matter. We're on stage, we're jumping around. This is basically a live thing, but it's all working together. So, uh, and then this part, this is the fun part where I get, where I do the. See if I'm tight on the grid here. Ah, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. I've had better days. I'm pretty good in here. I think this is just this pause. I was a little behind. I'm, I mean, I'm on the grid. We're good. We're clocking. We're clocking. Kevin G, on the session, he had an OB6 and a Nord, but on this tune, he only played the Nord, so I just deleted the OB6 file. Also running him through the archetype. Adds a little vibe to the Nord. Here's without it. Here's with it. So now let's just listen to the whole rhythm section. It's a 30 second song. So you can hear pretty much the whole time, we're just sticking to one pattern. That's it. A lot of people would be very tempted to add extra stuff or do little things in there. For me, I know I got Sonny T on the team. He's gonna take those spots and we've given him that permission. Nega's gonna do some of her stuff, but we're also leaving a lot of room for the horns to be able to shine in that because the horns are such a huge part of this ensemble and a very important role within the context of this whole project. So I wanted to make sure that I left room for them. And for the horn parts, Michael Nelson and I, Michael's the horn arranger and trombone player. Basically, I sent him demos. I think pretty much everything for this one I had kind of laid out just by like, okay, here's the horn things. I went, bow, da da da, something like that. And then, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. And what he does is he creates, he takes that little one finger piano, like MIDI horn thing that I do, and he brilliantly arranges it for the six horns. So the way that I have it set up in my session is I put all the trumpets, or excuse me, all the brass, the two trumpets and the trombone into a brass bus and then the woodwinds into a winds bus, and then those two buses go into an all horns bus. And that way I can kind of, what I do is I get the blend right between the brass, get the blend between the woodwinds, then I blend those two groups together, and then the whole thing, how it relates to the rest of the band. For me, that just helps me compartmentalize that stuff. So when I, so it's not like, oh, turn up trumpet one and trumpet two and the trombone. I can just go to the brass bus and mess with that stuff. So here's just the horns. Uh, I'll just play it all the way through so you can hear. And you can hear what kind of bleed we've got happening 
we're on opposite sides of the stage. And so then also there's a little bit of time delay. So maybe the drums will feel a little bit behind, uh, just a natural, natural uh, speed of sound thing. Some of these some of these guys are matching the rhythm section and then it weaves in and out certain things poking out to add energy and then the second half we had this thing we had this line with the with the saxes so i'll just play the saxes because this is a fun line that's fun that's a really fun section and I like having the alto sax kind of the left, tenor on the right, bury a little bit over here. It, it just kind of creates this different stereo effect. I, I messed around with panning them all together to make it sound like one instrument, but it actually felt better to be wide. So now let's, let's, let's just listen to the brass because that's also, there's a lot of power up there. Strand and Lampley up high. That's amazing. The fun thing about that, you hear Lampley and Strand up top on the trumpets. They get their attacks together, but they also get their releases together. And that's one of the nuances that not everybody is always thinking about, is getting the releases right. Huge in this band. And Michael Nelson, I'm telling you, if there's one stickler for making a horn section sound like a synth, it's Michael Nelson. He wants stuff to be tight. He was actually kind of mad at me, like, Man, I, I really wanted more rehearsal with these horns, man. We could have been a lot tighter. I'm like, dude, you guys are tight as can be. It's like, guys, believe me, it could be better. It could be better. This feels awesome to me. But I know Michael, hey, he's got respect for the craft, respect for the tightness. I'm down with the grid. So let's, let's scope this. These cats are on the grid. I mean, this is... That's all the instruments. So, like I said, the first half is kind of the introduction of the song, and then there's, there's that middle thing where I enter on the show, and then the second half of it is this stair step up. It should feel like there's more energy. So we build that into literally every part. The horn section has that built in where, at first it's just the sax is going bump ba da ba da ba ba da bump ba ba da ba da ba ba, and the trombone, brass is playing up high. Second half. Lampley joins in on the rhythm section line and to kind of cover for the saxophones that are now doing da 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 So it's, it's fun because now their roles kind of shift, but Lampley's also still covering his original part. It's a way to make the horn arrangement one thing at the beginning, and then the second half, it ramps up. The way that uh, Nega is playing the percussion, that sets it up so the arrangement is bigger the second half. Pitar does the same thing when he's playing. And on the show, the show version, I'm just not playing guitar in the first half. I enter at the at uh, this little this little line. And naturally then it kind of explodes a little bit more. So the tough thing is how do you have enough energy to really capture the attention out of that first section, but also save that sixth gear for the second half? You know, it, it's it's one of those things where I could have written a bunch of different things, made it a lot more intricate. But I felt like for a show theme, it should really only have a couple little simple parts to it that make it a little more approachable, make it more hooky, and then also just not overload. Like if somebody wants to sing this theme back, there's kind of only two things that they would choose from, and either one of those would represent this tune in a way that's totally fine. Where if I would have added a bunch of extra parts, it's like, well, What's the theme song? Oh, is it this thing or is it that or is it this? Really, this is just kind of that rhythm section line and the horn stuff. So I was really intentional about trying to keep it 
Simple, high energy, but also not commanding too much attention from the listener because the theme song is also kind of a backdrop, but a very forefront backdrop for what's happening on the screen for the show. Okay, and then the other thing that I added in post-production is some of these sound effects. Okay, so check this out. Here's my sound effects because I wanted to add a little more drama to my entrance as the host and as the band leader for this show. And this is actually something that I grabbed from Cody Fry when we did our Want Me Back video together where I do this kind of grand entrance. And it's kind of, it's basically counting off. It's this four beat count off to me starting, but it's putting on my guitar, tuning up the guitar, plugging it in. And then when we come back in, I'm, I have the sound effect that I added to just help the downbeat. So here's just the sound effects on their own. <laughs> That's literally just me going <laughs> into a microphone, putting it into auto tune and turning the format, changing the format of it or whatever. So it, it kind of gives you the chipmunk thing. So it's just my count in. Two, three, four. Bibba dibba 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 ba. That's it. And then I also played around with some other things. Like we were gonna have a voiceover. I, I recorded this voiceover just as a demo to give to this this dude on Fiverr or whatever to to do our <laughs> that we found to do the voiceover for the show. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Corey and the Wall Knows. Featuring Corey Wall. I was set to have the announcer until finally I saw it synced up to the video. It's like there was already just so much going on. We did some visual effects for some of my entrances and then me running down and grabbing my guitar. It was just a little too much. So we just bailed on the announcer. We recorded everything to a click. Does that mean it's at any, does that mean it's lifeless and stale? No, not at all. It just is kind of our, uh, I think of it as bumper bowling, right? Keeps us in our thing. We're still hitting strikes and spares. But we just got some we just got some guardrails up to make sure that we're keeping it there. Because also, you can see sometimes we get a little excited and we push a little bit or pull back. The click just kind of keeps us in line. And also because the stage is pretty wide, because some of them had one ear out. If they're hearing the the time delay from the drums all the way across the stage, then you know it turns from Delta Force to Dragon Force. And that name is already taken by a dope band. All right, last microphone here is my lav mic. So this is what it sounds if your ear was attached to my chest, because that's where this microphone is. No guitar amp. Right? It's pretty fun. Pretty fun, huh? Yeah, and I mean, it drives engineers nuts because we, we have fun after the take. We have fun during the take, and when the take's done, we sometimes laugh, high five, say yeah, yes, cool. It drives the video team nuts. It drives the audio team nuts, but Guess what? We're having a good time. We're not gonna stifle our good time. Now you can hear there, there's no guitar amp. There was a little bit of bass amp because Sonny wanted to be able to feel the bass a little bit. I totally get it. But in the room, it didn't sound very awesome. We had the PA on just like this much and it was all relying on our monitors. So everybody had in-ear monitors. Even though I don't have an amp on stage, everybody's got my guitar in their ears. Everybody has my lav mic in the ears because some tunes, there was improvised lengths of sections and their solos where somebody's keep going, okay, there's a lot of momentum. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I could just kind of talk rather than yelling. I'd be like, all right, let's go, let's go. I could kind of lean over and talk into my lav mic and everybody in the band could hear me. And also the camera crew could hear me. Oh. 
Corey's saying it's they're moving on. Next thing. So the way that we did this, it wouldn't be the most fun to listen to in the room unless you had an in-ear pack with a mix, which most people in the room did. And Jake, uh, my front of house engineer, and he was also running monitors. He just kind of had those things available. So that's an example of just getting a good album recording and getting a good video recording. But if there was an audience in the room, there probably would have been a lot more bleed because the PA would have been on and it would have been a lot louder. And then it would have been even harder to mix. Would it have sounded worse? I don't know. It would have been less controlled. There would have been more room noise and that's okay. Like the song United on the album, Antoine's vocal mic was picking up a ton of extra stuff in the room. We use an RE320 for that. And his voice sounds great on that mic, but it just picked up so much more from the room. So that song in particular has a lot more room noise to it because stuff was bleeding into his vocal mic. The mic that we use for Cody Fry, a little tighter of a pattern. So on that song, it didn't have quite as much bleed, but still it's a little more than some of these. And that's just kind of what you get. So with a song like this, with a recording session like this, you just have to know what you're going into and also find some, somebody who's a mixing engineer that understands how to work in this context and not completely complain. It's like, oh, I hear drums and the horn mics. It's like, yeah, because they were in the same room. But like you heard, the horn section's tight. The drums and percussion are tight. So let's just figure out a way to make it work. That's it. Corey and the Wong Notes theme song. You can check out the 30 to 31 second version on Spotify. And you can check out the shorter version on every episode of Corey and the Wong Notes, which is like, because this is on YouTube, it's probably like over here. It's probably, because you're watching this video, they're probably, the algorithm is suggesting you to watch the other things. So it's on there. See you later. Peace.